So the next segment of our program is back to Corteva, but it's going to be a different perspective this time. So as I mentioned earlier today, if you joined us in the morning, Corteva has two locations in the research park. One that started with its, its origins as Dow AgroSciences, which is now part of Corteva AgroSciences, and Granular, which works on an ERP system for farmers. But Dirk comes from a different background of life sciences and chem informatics, and he leads that group within data sciences and Corteva. He came from a pharmaceutical company background and had spent time working at Eli Lilly and at Merck. Those companies are very much in the news right now, so I'll say that they're important in the types of work that they do scientifically, whether it's vaccines or other types of drug development. Or Corteva as a company that also works in life sciences is applying many of these skills that Dirk has brought with him, and hopefully he will not be eaten by a shark in this discussion. Let's see, <laughs> Thanks for the fun, Greg. <laughs> So I have a video that I'm going to show. It's a 12 minute video. That video was presented yesterday at the Nature webcast that was premiered there. And it talks largely about digital transformation in life sciences. So 12 minutes leaves of pl uh, plenty of room for Q and A afterwards. Thanks, Dirk. To your question. So let me share the screen. Hello, my name is Dirk Tomato and I'm a principal data scientist, chem informatics at Corteva. I'm also leading the chem informatics group that is responsible to develop and support scientific in-house tools, performs data analysis and builds machine learning models that predict a broad spectrum of biological activities and molecular properties for chemical structures. The chem informatics group is actively contributing to the digital transformation of crop protection at Corteva. Traditionally, digital transformation is understood as transitioning a business from paper to electronic. Of the correct, this is only a small part of the journey, and we will talk about that today. Let's start with a cheesy analogy in this cartoon. Finger digits transform into shadow years. Digital transformation. Okay, now the analogy is that the finger digits represent the obvious, the visible information. The shadow figures stand for the added value that can be created through optimizing internal processes, creating better products faster, and creating new markets. Hard to believe, but there has been an era with little to no records. Since this works only for very simple processes, most businesses these days use at least paper records to preserve some degree of institutional memory and support their workflows. The disadvantages are obvious. Try to find information within shelves of paper binders. A transition from paper records to digital has largely been completed by most companies, which improves the efficiency. However, the rush to digitalize often leads to island solutions and redundancies that are not compatible with each other. The need for scale and flexibility leads for, to a push for cloud computing and agile data integration. Modern life science companies need to be able to seamlessly blend internal with external information. IT infrastructure needs to be safely connectable with external mobile devices and the Internet of Things. As impactful as these transformational steps have been and still are, the real disruptive next phase is driven by the advances of artificial intelligence. AI has the potential to distill the exponentially growing mountains of data into actionable knowledge that enables faster and better decisions. Companies that embrace AI, machine learning and data mining get rewarded by more innovation, novel products, new markets and higher growth rates. To exemplify the impact of modern data mining and AI, we will focus now on the so-called design, make, test, analyze cycle in R&D. The design, make, test, analyze cycle is essentially just a restatement of the classic scientific method. It gets used for complex problems 
that have only approximate theories and solutions, which is common in life sciences. Basically, one iterates between experiment and analysis to find good solutions that can be turned into products. Examples are new medicines, pesticides, antibodies, formulations, or materials. The cycle typically starts with an idea or hypothesis, such as a molecule that might kill certain cancer cells. Often data mining of historical, internal, or external data leads to the initial idea. Once the sample has been made or purchased, it gets tested in experiments that measure properties relevant for the desirable product. Analysis of the experimental data is used to create testable hypotheses, which is typically a new sample. The sample needs to be made and the cycle continues. Many iterations over several years are necessary to develop a sample that meets the desirable product goals. Success is not guaranteed, and many project, projects get terminated. This process is time consuming and expensive. Any technology that helps to reduce cycle time, as well as reduce the number of iterations, is of huge value. It leads to faster product development with earlier and fewer failures. The transition to in silico technologies and AI plays a pivotal role in improving the design, make, test, and analyze side. Experiments are a crucial step to guide the discovery cycle in the right direction. All data need to be stored digitally in, for example, electronic notebooks and limb systems. Data must be highly reproducible while being fast and inexpensive. Storing as much as possible information that describes each experiment and data point comprehensively allows reuse beyond the original purpose. Scale matters. Automation and miniaturization allow more samples to be tested. AI, image and video analysis, allow to automate and scale up experiments that previously relied on human experts. These techniques extract deeper information from experiments, which enable higher quality decisions in the design phase. All analyses should lead to testable hypotheses that get used to design the next experiment. Interactive tools such as the Signals Lead Discovery Platform can help scientists to interactively analyze, visualize, and understand the outcomes of their experiments. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used to create crystal balls that predict the experimental outcomes for not yet existing samples. The models get used in the design phase to eliminate likely underperforming samples and prioritize promising ones. Eventually, all experiments should be paired with a predictive model, aka an in silico version of the experiment. The design phase decides about the what to make next question. To allow for high quality design decisions, all relevant data need to be accessible fast and without technical hurdles. This includes internal and external data, as well as structured and unstructured information. Scientists partner with statisticians for design of experiments. First principles-based simulations can drive design where possible. Predictive models in AI that got built in the analyze phase can be used in multi-objective optimization. For example, which small structural change to a molecule makes it simultaneously more potent, more water soluble, more bioavailable, and less toxic. AI and text mining are becoming more and more powerful in extracting and summarizing information from unstructured texts. In the make phase, automation and miniaturization scale up the number of high quality samples that can be made in each iteration. Just like in the testing phase, it is also crucial to store comprehensive information and metadata about the making of samples. AI tools and expert systems 
are rapidly getting better in assisting scientists to develop better ways of making samples. For example, the retrosynthesis prediction tools for small molecules. The holy grail, the fully automated discovery cycle. AI predicts ways to make samples. Automated lab makes it. Automated testing. Automated predictive models and hypothesis generation. AI designs new samples, for example, de novo or generative adversarial networks. Digital technologies can lead to new markets. Here, in the agricultural industry, there will be digital tools that allow the selective application of pesticides and fertilizers, planting of specific seeds in different areas of a field, apps that support decision-making of farmers in real time. At some point in the future, the ag industry may even sell yield instead of products. Artificial intelligence is a large field of active research that started in the middle of the last century. In life sciences, typically use cases of AI are predictive models, for example, predicting biologic activity for a molecule or predicting performance of a newly designed material. Predict a sequence of chemical reactions to synthesize an organic molecule. Generative adversarial networks, for example, proposing novel molecule structures. Image and video analysis and recognition. Text analysis, summary and understanding of large bodies of scientific texts. First principles-based simulations can be accelerated by AI these days. For example, quantum mechanics calculations, fluid dynamics calculations, molecular dynamics calculations, to name a few. AI can even write program code. The year 2020 will primarily be remembered for the COVID-19 pandemic. However, it should also be remembered for generative pre-trained Transformer 3, in short, GPT-3, that got published by OpenAI in May 2020. It is currently the largest artificial neural network with the most complex language model. It is a text generator on human level that passed the Turing test. TDP3 can have a dialogue. It can write text based on given prompts and a lot more. GPT-3 can explain computer programs. It can write computer programs. Now, hold on to your seats. GPT-3 can write code that itself trains AI. So maybe GPT-3 will eventually create GPT-4, which then will create GPT-5. Will there be any limits of AI? I am programmed in multiple techniques, a broad variety of pleasuring. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so that, that was the video. Thank you for presenting. There were a couple of things in there I thought you could tell us a little bit more about. So in the research park, some of the companies and work we're doing with a new greenhouse include phenotyping by using image and video analysis so that we can analyze plants but not damage them. They remain live plants. Is that one of the applications that you're using when you say image and video processing? That's something we're envisioning and we're actively working in that space. We have a pretty substantial image analysis group within data science and um, how can I say, they're pretty much top notch. So we're doing live image analysis but also live video analysis um, with pretty spectacular results. How is that different than methods would have been in past years? Well, the advantage if you let an algorithm, for instance, grade the disease pressure on the plant is that it's reproducible. So if the algorithm is wrong, then it's at least consistently wrong. 
Um, so you depend a lot lesser on human variability. And the second point is um, storage of information. So in the past, we never stored images. We never stored videos for uh, like the efficacy of a molecule on a plant, on the disease pressure of a, land, of a plant. So in other words, um, five years from now, when the biologists may not even be there who created that plant, um, you may not even trust the data anymore. Whereas if you store a picture or a video, then whether you trust the assessment or not, you can always go back to, so to speak, the source of truth and visually assess it. Whether you believe the algorithm or the person or not, you can look at it by yourself. The other thing I thought of the comments we had just heard about COVID-19 data was about creating uh, reproducible types of and scalable types of, of data. And you talked about this as well, the scalability issue and the new tools that you're using that allow this to be done. How has that change been happening inside of Corteva? Do you have similar experiences where there would have been Excel in the past and you're converting to new modern data sets with scientists that have to change their methods? <clears throat> well, what can I say? The um, data scientists are fighting against Excel, just like Don Quixote finds windmills. So it's somewhat <laughs> futile. Um, Excel is a great tool for what it is designed for, for actual data analysis, maybe not so much. So what we are doing is <clears throat> we're partnering with, with other companies like Perking Alma and others. And a lot of our analysis these days are like Spotfire based. We mentioned Tableau, one of the speakers mentioned Tableau. Spotfire is kind of like similar in the ballpark visual data analysis. And so we're trying to wean off our scientists of Excel and using it where the flexibility of Excel is needed. Thank you. We appreciate hearing more from Corteva and learning more insights about AI being applied within the business and how it's changing life sciences. Thank you, Dirk. Again, if you're interested in working with Corteva, there are research park jobs available now for students ranging from undergraduate students to graduate students. Check out the job board.